Inside the X is a short newsletter every Friday designed to give you some fun right before the weekend. It'll include links to blog posts, articles, books, quotes, and recent purchases I've made. Everything is handpicked to add value to your life. To join, email entertainmentxpodcast at gmail.com. Good morning, Vietnam! But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Do and and beyond! Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? It's classified. You talking to me? I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. I can't lie! Expecto Patronum! Entertainment X. You never know what you're going to get. For this episode, I sit down with Bjorn Belinder. Bjorn is an accomplished dancer, photographer, and... I would say, in my own opinion, master of life. This guy has, I really think he's got it figured out. I really do. You'll see exactly what I mean when you listen to the conversation and you hear about his life path. I really hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Um, He's a great, he's a great human. And I think there's much, many, many, many takeaways from our conversation. So I hope you enjoy this episode and keep on keeping on. We're back, and today with me is Bjorn Belinder. Bjorn, thank you for sitting down with me. Thanks for having me. I'd love to be here. This is going to be a fun conversation about a bunch of different topics, and it comes at a wonderful time because I'm participating in your Zen December group that we have on Facebook that you have, I'm a part of, and it's absolutely wonderful to stay centered, especially during this time of year with the seasonal depression and the... Anxiety to purchase a lot of gifts. Yes. And the lack of time and large amount of things that need to be accomplished by the end of this year. Yeah, no (laughs) kidding. Well, and I think that that lack of time is like emphasized by the shortness of the days at this time of year too. Yeah. So it's almost like on top of all the lists of things that you feel like you need to accomplish, the day is this much shorter. It feels this much shorter. It's true. It's so true. So doing a little bit of research about you and what you do in this world, I stumbled across this uh, quote that's on your, it's actually on your Find the Light photography website. And it's the beginning of your About Me section. Hmm. And it's, um, there is a light in everything that connects us all. And I love that because when I see you, you have such a bright light. And I know that that is cultivated. That's action. You've thought that out. That's being actively. And I, to tell me if I'm wrong. Like, be like, if you like, no, Clay, I, what the I, hell are you talking no, about? No, 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 no. This is what I, I see. I, <laughs> <laughs> tell me if I'm incorrect. I am receiving what you're saying. I, I definitely believe that anything that you experience in me in that sort of category yeah. isn't there. Okay. So there's a paradox in that it's not because of me. Cause it's, it's really not me. Huh. You're experiencing something that's I think bigger than the human me. Huh. Uh, and then on another level, it is cultivated by practices that I bring into my life every day. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I understand that. that. No, I see that. I see that. I like this. You're taking the conversation to the next level. Is it snowing? (laughs) It is, I think. Okay. It's flurries. Uh, It's flurries. Light flurries. Welcome, Uh, flurries. (laughs) Welcome to New York City, baby. (laughs) Um, And that is so, to me, that's so evident in the photos you take, in the way you behave, the way you react, respond. I know. (laughs) Oh, sometimes I react. (laughs) Right. We're human. We're human. So I want to, I'm going to, we're going to jump right in, but that's the initial um, foray into this conversation. When did you begin to dance? Uh, let's see. So when I was six years old, I remember going to my sister's dance recital. Okay. Um, and then even before going to her recital, her dance shoes would be sitting around the house and I would pick up her tap shoes and like bang them around on the floor. Yeah. Um, and so I, I was fascinated with all of that. But I remember I have this like really clear memory and of course who knows if it's an actual memory because of the way that we sort of create memories by retelling certain aspects of our past to ourselves but uh, um, I have this really clear memory of attending her dance recital my sister is a year older than me Mm -hmm. and she had started dance just that year previous and being there and I think it was at my 
my high school auditorium actually. Um, and just the, there was, there was something about the, the glitter and the music and just like the bright costumes and the people dancing on stage, like something came alive deep in my heart that just, it was like, it was just like this connection with something deep inside of me that was really woken up, you know? And so, and I don't know in the aftermath of the show, if I was like talking about it to my mom, I don't remember. I don't remember a lot about being six, but I, <laughs> but I just remember that experience of being at that recital and just feeling like something in me was coming alive and like I needed to be involved with that. Mm -hmm. And so my mom asked me if I wanted to start dancing the following season with my sister who at the time didn't really enjoy doing anything on her own. Mm -hmm. And so I said yes. And so I was six when I took my first class just on the cusp of turning seven. And uh, that was, yeah, that was the beginning for me. How old were you when you just decided to like stick with it through? Uh, <laughs> well, I, laugh. I know it's always like a no, loaded question. The <laughs> reason that I laugh is because like there are so many uh, stops and starts in my trajectory of all of that. Okay. So, I mean, I could talk at length about it, but I'm not going to because this is not going to be three hours long. <laughs> so, uh, I, I started when I was seven yeah. and then a few years in, I started competing. I was at one of those dance studios that, uh, does dance competition. Yeah. Um, and the competition aspect of it again, like something drew me to, like I loved watching the dancing, but I didn't love my experience of being there. It was a bit of a, how do I say this? It, it was a, it was an intense environment. My, yeah. my home studio growing up. Yeah. With like, without knowing it all, we wound up enrolling in this studio. That's just a, it's like a, it's a force in the competition world. Yeah. Like if you're in the dance competition world, you probably know the name of the studio. It's like one of those things. Like if you've heard it, you'd be like, Oh, those people. Um, cause they're, they're really fantastic. Yeah. Um, and the, the environment is very, uh, aggressive. I almost want to say, at least that's how I experienced it when I was a kid and sure. I'm very sensitive. And so, it was challenging for me in a lot of ways to be in that environment. Mm. Um, and so I would, I would quit. <laughs> so there were a number of times between, you know, starting at seven, well, starting at six, just about to turn seven and graduating high school that I quit. I quit three times, maybe mm. four. Um, because for whatever developmental stage I was in, in my upbringing, I felt like, I don't belong here or I can't connect with something here or it's yeah. too intense for me yeah. and I have to go away. And then so I would, I would, I'd quit and I'd pull back. But then that following year I would go to the uh, competitions just to see what they were doing. Mm. And I'd have that same experience again that I had had at my sister's dance recital when I was six, yeah. you know, like that thing in me would just keep like beckoning me back and I would just feel like, Oh my God, I have to go back. Yeah. Like there's something here for me. And so, you know, and my mom would say, all right, well, if you want to go back, you need to go talk to the Larkins and you need to <laughs> tell them, Ask you, need them. To, you need to tell <laughs> Michelle, shout out to Michelle Larkin, who was just an incredible human being. Um, like I want to come back. Yeah. And so, yeah. so I would do that anyway, blah, blah, blah. I, I would go back the next year and then depending on where we were in my journey, maybe I quit again the following year and okay. I went back the so year after like you're that. you're on, you're off? Exactly. Like, For a yeah, little bit of time there. Okay. And then by the time I was in 10th grade, 10th, 11th, 12th, I stuck with it. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I graduated from high school, I was definitely burnt out. Mm. Um, I had it in my head that I wanted to have some sort of like serious career, whatever the heck that meant. And, <laughs> uh, I, and so, yeah. you know, I was going to go to a, a good liberal arts school and had no intention of ever performing again, actually, mm -hmm. um, without really any clarity about what it was that I wanted to do career wise. Mm -hmm. Um, but I happened to go to a university that had a fabulous theater program, not for that intent at all, but I wound up there. And so, as a result, it was just one of those things. And now something that I will say probably again and again is that like, I feel like all along something has been, regardless of what tangible steps I'm taking in my life, 
I feel like there's something bigger than me that's ushering me along yeah. like the whole way. And so when I showed up as a freshman, new student week in college, you know, determined to, I don't know, begin to find my way. And I wound up just meeting, well, I wound up meeting this woman, girl, woman, in college, what is that? I don't know, you're 20 something. Um, female, she was female. <laughs> <laughs> this wonderful female who yeah. was going to be directing the big winter musical that year. And I was at this cosmic bowling event, New Student Week. And so you'd bowl and you'd dance. And she was part of this group that was hosting this cosmic bowling event. And so I, I bowled and I danced and she was like, you're a dancer you need to come audition for my musical that I'm directing. And yeah. I was like, okay. And then on the inside, I was kind of like, oh, no, I'm not interested because that's not what I'm here for. Um, but long story less long, I just kept running into her. So oh. within the next week, I ran into I ran into her on the way to the theater building where I was headed to get a, a work-study job. And she was like, so I'll see you at that audition. And I was like, yeah. And then on the inside, I was kind of like, nah, I don't think so. But then I ran into her a third time. And she was like, so see you on Sunday or whatever day it was. And right. I was like, okay, got it. Message clear. When she said to you the first time, like you should audition, you're like, that's not what I'm here for. I don't know that I said that to no, her. Or thought oh. it. Or yeah. Thought oh, it. I definitely thought it. Yeah. What were you here for? Well, that's what I, I wasn't sure. I mean, for me, I think, I think there was an aspect of me that was just like, I knew that I needed to have sort of a container where I would figure that out. Okay. And that would be college. I had this concept in my head of you know going off to college and it needed to be leaving the small suburb that I grew up in, mm -hmm. in suburban St. Paul, Minnesota. And it would be like far enough away from home where you know I'd get to go and make a bunch of my own mistakes without mom and dad being next door, but with them being close enough to like come to the school if any there was any reason for them to come, which right. there wound up being lots. Um, and so, yeah, truly, I didn't know okay. what it was going to be. But yeah. I think there was a deeper part of me that did know and was already connected to the, maybe the truth. I mean, this is hypothesis yeah. or my making meaning out of what happened. Okay. Um, that yes, I was going to continue on a performance trajectory, even mm. though it wasn't my conscious intent. Mm. Okay. Yeah. When did photography come about? Uh, well, photography for me was something that I was always fascinated in. My uncle was a photographer. Uh, in fact, I remember, one year when I was a child where he was one of the photographers that was like taking our school photos. Oh, cool. Yeah. And I remember, <laughs> and I have these memories of, um, he and my aunt used to live in this great old Victorian, uh, in Minneapolis and on the th third attic level floor, he had like all this photo gear up there. And I used to love anytime we'd be at their house to just like go and look at all the stuff. I was really fascinated with it. Yeah. When I was in high school, I took a photography class, um, which I loved. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was clueless. You know, you start at something and you start really terribly, right? Because mm -hmm. no one's an expert at anything out the gate. And I remember the first roll of film. Yes, this was film days. Um, What's that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, so the first <laughs> roll of film that I developed and made prints from, I was like befuddled because nothing was in focus because I didn't realize that you needed to actually focus uh, the lens uh, in order to get a clear photo. That helps. So, yeah. yeah, I learned. I mean, talk about learning through failure, right? Yeah. So, yeah, an okay. important lesson, right? So you've been, that's been another kind of on and off Yes. For a hot minute. Yeah, as absolutely. Well. well, so I did that class in high school and then I wound up working at a portrait studio in back home in my home suburb from, I think it was my, I was like sophomore year of, of high school, sophomore, junior, senior, and then into college. So for okay. about four years, four or five years, I worked part time at a portrait studio and initially it was just, you know, developing film, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. within my first week of being there, they asked me if I would be interested in training to become a portrait photographer there. Um, and I said yes. And uh, they trained. I went off to Portrait Academy and I became yeah. one of those people that takes portraits of babies and families. And I mean, my family would get our our family photo taken at Pro. This was this place called Pro X. It no longer exists. It it was in Minnesota and Colorado, I believe. Um, huh. But yeah, so I worked at 
Pro-X, and there are still lots of family Pro-X portraits of the Belinders uh, at the Belinder House back in Woodbury, Minnesota. And uh, yeah, I became one of those portrait photographers. I And you know what? I am still friends with, and this is like, like a tribute to the good in social media, like I'm still friends with a number of my photographer friends mm. from Pro-X, which was super cool because... I learned so much by watching what they were doing, you know? I mean, and this was at a time where everything, you know, nothing was, uh, you couldn't see it on the back of a camera immediately. You'd yeah. have to process the roll of film and then you'd look at then prints of everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You'd know if you focused it. Um, oh my goodness. Yeah. And so. What did you learn? Well, I learned, I learned that there were aspects of lighting that appealed to my heart, you know? Like what? There was just a way of, there was a quality to the way that some of the photographers there used light in the camera room that just got me excited. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like, oh, that's beautiful. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know? And then I got to learn from them by seeing what they were doing that just appealed to me that I wanted to learn how to replicate. Mm -hmm. So I... I mean, it was the beginning of learning so much. I mean, the learning never stops. Yeah. So, I'm curious if you're if you're willing to go into it because I know it's a case by case basis with the subject you're taking photos of and the environment and everything. But for someone who doesn't know anything about lighting a photograph, was it different placements of the light, shadows, backlighting versus front lighting versus flash? brightness <laughs> forget yeah, definitely for no that's that's great uh definitely terminology. yeah definitely like the placement of the lights okay and sort of the, the yeah the proximity of the light toward the subject mm. and then the way that that created highlights and shadows so there was there were two like well there were three lights in this photo studio you know a backlight for the background which you could turn off or turn on yeah. um, whether you you know depending on what the effect that you wanted and then there were there were two main lights but you could do an effect that we called soft lighting where you would turn one of the main lights away and then you'd bring one of the other ones quite close and and that soft lighting effect I just love it you use it today I love it. I mean, I do. I mean, I guess I really do. I, yeah. I, I hadn't thought much about how that translates, but yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I mean, I still, I still love that sort of effect. There's something that's I don't know, glowy about it that yeah. I just really love. And then, you know, we were doing so many sessions with young kids and they just look so beautiful with this soft, like close ups of their, their kind of innocent, Faces. They're just so like open to the world, you know. I feel like they're not guarded and like hiding anything unless yeah. they've been really rehearsed about how to smile. Right. Yeah. Like the performers like, <laughs> that yes. you took pictures of. Because you did you did a very kind thing for the group we had uh, over the summer with these like incredible are they editorial shots? Like what would uh, is there a classification for what that that is? There probably is, but I'm not sure what I would call it. I mean I, I would just call it sort of creative portraiture, but yeah, it was it was, it was creative. Yeah. The lighting that you would use, the colors of the flashes. I don't think I don't. I have never seen that before, and that was like so colorful. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I mean, I definitely wasn't inventing anything, but I was just working with what was there, and we had yeah. such a great ca cast, and yeah. everyone was so uh, photogenic. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and our backstage space really lent itself beautifully to kind of this concept that I had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're oh, absolutely gorgeous. Um. Do you, when you're looking for, or when you're searching locations and what have you to take a picture of someone, like say outside, yeah. are you going for like a, a depth of field? Do you, do you have any like rules of thumb on where you place the subject in the photo versus, cause I've seen some really beautiful photos of, I mean, they're all beautiful. The ones where the, you had one of a dancer, like in between trees, but it was like you were far away, but the tree, I don't know if you know the photo I'm talking about or not. It was on Maybe. Facebook a while back. Anyway, I'm just curious. Does anything come to mind with that well, sort of? For me, I love to I love to create a sense of depth. Okay. 
So it's not really all that exciting to me if it just looks like everything's in focus. So if there are any sort of angles that I can use to show that there is some sort of distance between the camera and the subject, I want to do that. Mm. You know, there's uh, something about leading lines. So if I'll often like lay down on the ground mm. so that the perspective is more intriguing to me, I guess, than mm. if I was just looking straight on. Right. Um, but it, it again, it depends on what I'm shooting. So like yeah. if it's if it's headshots, it's one thing. But if it's portraits, it's something else. Yeah. Um, I love a cloudy sky. I love a good yeah. overcast sky. You can kind of make that work anytime. Uh. And if it's super bright out, then I love to put the subject uh, in front of the sun so that they're being backlit. And then you just have to be sure to put them to be photographing them somewhere where the light that's bouncing up toward them isn't like grass because then you're going to get a big green wash on them from the way that the sun is bouncing on the grass in front of them. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely like case by case, but I, I love to show some sort of sense of, of depth when possible. And if there's something that I can be, that can be right in front of my camera to be sort of obscuring a portion of the frame, maybe to create a little bit of a vignette yeah. uh, with blur, I like, I don't know. I just think that's pretty. <laughs> so I like to do that sort of stuff. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see it. I can see it. That's, um, I have a logistic question. I mean, these are all logistic questions, but another one, how have you gotten better at scheduling your time with this particular photography endeavor? Cause I know it's, it's time consuming. Yeah, it is. Uh, I, I mean, I definitely take everything case by case. Um, you know, I'm, f I'm fortunate enough that I just, for whatever reason, my schedule gets created like very much in the moment. I don't do a whole lot of like planning way out in the future, um, which is a little bit, I think it would probably make a lot of people freak out because it requires a certain amount of trust that yeah. a schedule will materialize, <laughs> you know, like stepping into the week. But right. like, I mean, for instance, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but like sorry. But yeah. for instance, yeah. like something that I shot on Monday, I was asked to shoot on Monday. Like I was I was asked to shoot to, on this past week. So I was scheduled to shoot something Monday night, um and then Monday afternoon, um I was it was actually kind of funny because I was shooting an event last Friday night and I forgot my headphones there. And so one the woman that had hired, hired me right. to do this um you know, I texted her to be like, hey, how can I retrieve these headphones? And she was like, well, why don't you come in on Monday? I'll be in Midtown at this place. And I said, okay, that'll be great. And then when I finished my meditation practice on Monday and turned my phone on, there was a text from her that was like, hey, so actually, would you be willing to come in and photograph what I am doing today? Because uh -huh. they forgot to hire a photographer. You know, so yeah. stuff like that actually happens in my world a lot weekly <laughs> I mean seriously yeah like I photographed a holiday party for an acting studio last year and I was wondering if they were going to ask me to do it again this year I mean there's what thousands tens of thousands of photographers in Manhattan mm. you know like there are no guarantees um and then again this morning when I finished my morning meditation I turned on my phone and and there was the email that was like hey sorry for the late minute notice mm. but like can you photograph our party? It's next Friday, you know? So, yeah. And I have, I have had enough experience of this sort of evolution of the way that my schedule forms mm. that, and it requires a lot of taking your hands off of life, mm. like, which is, comes through practice and a lot of years of it. Mm. Um, because you have to believe that something's coming which even if you can't see it, even if you can't mm -hmm. see it, which is, yeah, it's kind of freaky, but it's, um, it's, it's extraordinary yeah. as it happens. So I don't know if I really answered your question, but I, there are times when I, when I overdo it and I've got way too much on my plate and then I freak out a little bit about like, oh, I can't possibly do all this right now and right. like take care of myself. But, and then I learn you know, about how to, s then I just have to be more communicative and say like, Hey, I'm not going to be able to get this to you until later. Yeah. Yeah. Do, uh, do you try and do most of your editing certain day of the week, certain time of day? Do you listen to music when you do it? Um, I true to form for me, I really just follow my heart. So I don't have a routine. 
I mean, the routine that I have is like when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is I have a morning like meditation prayer practice and like that is a guarantee. Um, but beyond that, it's whatever it feels. And when I say feels, I don't mean like emotion feels. I mean like inner guidance feels. So like some days I will feel like, okay, I got to work all day. Like I need to get this, I, I need to get this project completed and delivered. So I'm going to basically be at my computer most of the day and maybe I'll take it somewhere else so that I'm not just sitting at home. Um, I, I love to sometimes listen to maybe podcasts uh or Which have ones? like a <laughs> Do any kind of entertainment of... x yeah, um, <laughs> of course entertainment x i was looking for that yeah. uh, i i love the ted radio hour okay that's like a favorite of mine i yeah, listen I to ted talks lewis house school of greatness oh i don't he know that has I'll a great, check it out. he interviews a lot of people about he, well it's mindfulness and other things but it's a school of greatness it's the title and then um hidden brain those are two that come to mind I've that I think you that. might appreciate. That's I'll, NPR. Okay, I'll have to check those out. Yeah, I, Anywho. I'm in it. Yeah, I love NPR. Um, Podcast, great. Yeah. So, and and I'll occasionally like, oh my goodness, I was, <laughs> I was, uh, so I was editing all of these headshots that I had taken of these theater students. Um, I've been I've been heading up to Rochester the last four years in a row to do headshots for uh, the theater students at Nazareth College, uh, and it's become a progressively bigger job every year just because more people partake. And l- last year, I remember I <laughs> I don't know if I'm um, proud of this. <laughs> I watched and I put quotes around watched because you know I was editing like the entire series of Gilmore Girls while I was editing that project. Oh, and I mean, man. that's like eight seasons. Yeah. So to give you an idea of like how many hours that took, many. it was a lot of time. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I, I want to go back to this inner guidance and not the feels because you, and I was key that you said it's not emotional. Yeah. Um, how have you gotten better? And this will work into the next part of our conversation here. How have you gotten better at saying no to things? Yeah. Well, let's see practice i mean it's definite practice i it's interesting because there are you know there are books out there that i t- that talk about just like say yes to everything and then there are other books that say that help to empower you to say no to things mm-hmm. and i mean we're in boundary setting territory and i don't think that i don't know i feel like boundaries are so personal And I mean, you know, boundaries, not just about like your physical space, but I mean like your schedule and your kind of your whole world, your emotional world, who you're friends with, how you structure your days, how you structure your life, um, which of course plays into work, you know, what you say yes and no to in terms of who you spend your time with. Um, And for me, and again, this is something that's just been because, becoming clearer and clearer over time in the spiritual work that I've been doing, um, that there will just be a sense in me that like something is clearly a yes or something is clearly a no, but more often than not, it's somewhere in between and I have to sit with it a little bit. So, and sitting with it, I mean like, I don't generally poll the public about what they think I should do. Um, I don't think that that's an awful way to make decisions. However, for me, like I definitely go inside and ask like, is this something that is in alignment with what I want to be doing? Hmm. And there are times when I, my mind says, Oh, I don't want to do that, but I can feel my heart really open. And I don't mean like I can feel my physical heart open. <laughs> I'm just like get I myself to the blood. hospital now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean like my energetic heart center will like spread open and I will feel what I would say is I feel the energy of that thing like pouring through, like it's manifesting spiritually. Even if the mind's saying no. Yeah. And so I'll be like, well, I know that feeling. That's a definite yes. And so like <laughs> I remember a couple of years back, a friend of mine had asked me if I had any interest in um, photographing dance competitions. 
uh, because he knew someone who needed a photographer for their company to photograph dance competitions. And my mind was like, no, <laughs> thank you. I have been in that world plenty. I'm good. Thanks yeah. so much. Um, but my heart really opened to it. And I was like, all right, this is a yes. There's something here for me. So I will say yes to this and see what happens. Do you wait for the mind to catch up or do you just say yes? Oh, I mean, there are times when I really hesitate because because oh. there's <laughs> there's a part, of, you know, because we no, uh, I, I am human and we get attached to we have comfort zones and we oh, have yeah, we, uh, we have definite ideas of what we think we should be doing or shouldn't be doing or what we want to or mm -hmm. don't want to be doing. And yeah, there are definitely times when my heart says yes to something that my head's like, oh, oh I'm not ready for that. No, 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 no. And occasionally I will, I will then say no, even though I feel a conflict of guidance inside. Mm -hmm. I am not, I mean, I'm by, by no means like a champion at always following that guidance to a T mm -hmm. uh, or even discerning it, Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's definite trial and error. Mm -hmm. And I think, sorry, no, I think that was just a superfluous and, and <laughs> I think that, uh, it's. It's interesting because the spirit, I, I, and this could be, we can open this up for a conversation, um, that like the spirit always knows the mind just has to catch up. So like, yeah, there is a larger sort of whatever you believe in, whether it's a God or, you know, an energy or whatever it is, that there is something that is kind of pulling you or pushing you, however you want to word it through life. You know, there's the spirit knows. Right. And we make all sorts of excuses why we shouldn't. Oh, yeah. Or should do something terrible. Oh, or yeah. Or shouldn't do something that's great. <laughs> like on a daily basis. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my that goodness. cookie. Schmackery's <laughs> not terrible. That it's actually single really good. cookie? No, no, no. But it's that idea of, of being more in tune with that because you notice that life starts to happen more for you as you follow the... Let the go. Spirit. Yeah, you let yeah. go. How have you gotten better at how have you gotten better at quitting i know we didn't talk about this before but you mentioned the word quitting a few times at yeah the beginning, and i've been wondering this a lot everyone quits winners quit they just quit at the right time that's interesting or they quit the right thing you know or they don't quit and they pull on through because they know so i'm just wondering if quitting at all i don't know if anything comes to mind in terms of that yeah i think that's such a great question um for me all right, I hopefully won't go off on a tangent here. I, I was recently listening to this TED Talk by Carol Dweck, who is a psychologist at Stanford, and she was talking about how children at a very young age are uh, encouraged in any number of different ways about their learning styles such that some kids wind up being the types of kids who have like a growth mentality about anything that they're trying to do, anything that they're trying to accomplish, whether or not they're good at it from the start, which most of us aren't good at it from the start. Mm -hmm. If they have a growth mindset, they recognize that like their efforts are going to reward them. And so even if they don't succeed right away, they're just going to keep on trying because they recognize that a lack of success right now doesn't mean a lack of success in the future. And so they're very growth oriented mm -hmm. where there are, Whereas there are other kids who, for whatever reason, have more of like a fixed mindset about talents and abilities. And so as a result, they wind up perceiving that if they're not good at something right now, then it's time to just try something else. And then as a result, your world gets built around just those things that you're kind of sure that you can succeed at mm -hmm. instead of like this much more wide potential world of the kids that have a growth mindset yeah. because they realize like failure right now doesn't mean it's the end of the road. Now, for whatever reason, I definitely feel like I very much relate to that fixed mindset child. So even though I am no longer a child, I feel like just listening to that, you know, sometimes when you hear someone say something, um, you just need it to, you just need something that's going on in you or something, some part of you to be like named in order for you to have a handle on it. So you can be like, Oh, that's what's going on in me. Like I can totally relate to that. And now I feel like I can do something about that. Yeah. Whereas before I just, I knew what was going on. It always sort of confused me, but I didn't really have a handle or a way to talk about it or a way to, you know, approach it in a way that would be beneficial to me. Yeah. And so 
listening to that, I've listened to it so many times now just because I, I firmly believe like so much of my life, I have been very afraid of yeah. moving toward something that I'm just not yet good at. Okay. Um, and so I wind up, I wind up, I don't even remember what your initial question was. Quitting. Quitting. Quit. Yeah, there we go. And so that's why it ties in. I, I have been like a big quitter in a lot of ways. Like, you know, I quit dance a bunch of times. I quit. <laughs> I, oh my goodness. I was not in a good space at, <laughs> at some point in my early twenties. Uh, who in the early twenties can't relate to that. Um, and I definitely right. like very full of a lot of like angst and sassafras, like quit my job at the portrait studio, <laughs> you know, like walked out on them Show when me. I, exactly. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so, uh, oh my, like at least I can laugh at it now. Um, you know, it's just like an immature attitude that like, and you can have that about, um, theater. You can have that about anything, but I can definitely yeah. understand how you can have that about theater. Like the show can't possibly go on if I'm not here, uh -huh. which and is just a very immature <laughs> attitude about kind of anything in life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for me, even though I'm not a spring chicken, like I feel like I'm learning, I am now learning about myself. Like what is my, how can I relate to a desire to quit mm -hmm. in me in a way that's actually proactive and that is supporting me through the thing that I might want to quit. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does. So I feel like I'm learning how to be a, I don't know if better quitter. Yeah. I don't think that's quite right. Cause it's, it's not about quitting. It's about like persevering really. And it's more about not quitting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that I it's that interesting thing though because you have like and I've heard the I think it's like Vince Lombardi has that quote about like winners never quit, quitters never win. But it's But that's just not true. That's bad advice. It's just not true. That's bad advice. Like yeah. if you're in a dead end job, leave. Leave, absolutely. You There's don't want to stay job. there. Yeah, yeah, like don't. You're not going to be a winner by not quitting. Right. Well, and I guess it depends on how you define winner, right? And it's all very Well, yeah, relative. yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, I'm not even talking about sports. I'm talking about life. But sure. it's still that I it's that idea. So it's really interesting. What was the the podcast episode? It was a TED Talk? Oh, yeah, it was a TED Talk. With uh TED the TED Radio Hour. Okay. And the episode was called Nudge. I have okay. <laughs> I have sent the link to this TED Talk to a number of friends because it's just so great. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's important. I mean, that's really important. That's really important because it's really important. And there are and there I, are other TED Radio Hour always um, sort of it takes about four or five different TED Talks that all kind of have a similar theme, okay. and then it fuses them together into one podcast that articulates more thoughts about that theme. And this yeah. one is just I mean that one was great, but like the whole nudge episode is fantastic. I'm gonna listen to it. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I like that because it and that adds so much comfort to your life. Oh my when goodness! When you know you don't have to hold out at something that's not working, right? You know? And the harder you force it, the less it'll probably work. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's something to be said for when a some doors just slam shut, mm -hmm. and they're meant to stay shut. Yeah. And I think we suffer <laughs> a yeah. we suffer that a lot so loudly to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad they're shut. Uh, no, you think well, and like, thank you God know. it's shut. Yeah. But we, you know, as humans, we do, we can get really, really fixated on yeah. what we think should constitute the next step or a place that we think that we need to go. Mm -hmm. And so we will like bang on that door and do everything, try it with all of our might to try to break it down. And some doors are just meant to stay shut, mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, a huge aspect of maturing and becoming more wise as you age is really about being able to identify like when to let a shut door remain shut. Yeah. Yeah. And conversely, like when to approach one <laughs> that it's time to open and walk through yeah. that we have been avoiding, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting navigating this. Um, do you have, if you're willing to share a burnout story or a story about burnout in general that led you into meditation when did that begin for you yeah do, do the two go together at all sure yeah they definitely do i mean i'm gonna try to make this really brief because this could be super long otherwise i there was a time which i sort of alluded to earlier when i was quitting my photography job um <laughs> i i was in my junior year of college and 
I, I was a mess. I was like really emotionally not well at all. And bless my, my parents, shout out mom and dad. Come I, on, mom. Oh my Come goodness, on, I have the greatest parents in the world. Just a pause to <laughs> of gratitude for them. Yeah. Um, they would come see me in everything. I did a lot of shows in college, and they would come see all of them. And they would not only come for the first weekend, but they would drive the six and a half hours, seven hours, uh, the second weekend to see all of them too. I mean, they couldn't be more supportive. And they came to see me in the fall musical, main stage musical that year, which was a chorus line, and they they could barely recognize me. Like, it, and this was the first time in in my life when you know it was really like whoa what is going on our kid is not our kid Mm -hmm. you know and I I was in a really dark place and by the end of that year that school year I mean there's so much more I could say there I mean my dad remained in town between those show weekends to get me hooked up with counseling services on campus because like they were really concerned with me which I think they had great reason to be um uh, you know, in the midst of it all, I had no idea what was going on because I was in the fury of all of the stuff. Um, but by the end of the year, I actually, I dropped spring quarter. I checked myself into the hospital. I like was not in a good place. Yeah. And uh, so I, I would, I would consider that a pretty big burnout. Yeah. And, and though that didn't immediately connect me into, you know, a meditation practice, it directly relates because it wasn't until about five and a half years later that I I had a memory of some trauma resurface for me. And when I had the memory of the trauma resurface, Mm -hmm. then I got back into counseling so that I could actually address the problem that I, you know, was unaware of back then. And it was when I was in, in counseling services that, that other time, you know, years later, that really unlocked something in me. Um, I remember there, there wasn't some big profound shift while I was in a therapy session, but in between sessions, you know, I'd get triggered by something and I would just like cry in this massive cathartic way. Um, and when it would be done, I would just feel this sense of, of like peace or grandeur or, it's just a relaxedness that felt really foreign and yet also really felt like coming home. Mm. And it was around that time that the dance company that I was uh, dancing with had an acupuncturist that was offering pro bono acupuncture for the, um, for us. I don't know why, but it was such a gift. And, um, he had given us, uh, some, those of us who went to see him, some meditation music that we could use. And I think, I mean, my vague memory of it at the time was like that he said, just, you know, sit down. And if you're really tired, just lay down and just put the music on and just, that's it. You know, so that was like my first experience of meditation. But what was really fascinating was that that whole time, well, this uh, kind of, shift was going on for me it really was a big shift when I was when I was in counseling for that trauma because it just unloaded all of this junk you know like I said I I would it was almost like clockwork like at some point during the week in between sessions something would trigger me I would it would it could be like a song or could be a film that I just watched or a tv show or Mm -hmm. something um and I would just start crying like profusely and I've always been a crier like crying's been a friend to me ever since I was a child (laughs) shall we say okay and so having an extensive relationship with crying this was like a different variety of crying it was like a cosmic crying Mm -hmm. and so you know when that started just it was it was fascinating because at the same time I started getting like book recommendations from friends that would be like friend A who does not know friend B would recommend such and such a book and then friend B the next day would recommend the same book. Yeah. And I'd be like, all right, so clearly I should check this out. I'll read it. You know, yeah. and, and they were all like kind of spiritually based self-help type books. So I like Wayne Dyer. I remember like one of the first books that I read that kind of sparked my interest in a sort of different approach attitude about life was uh 
it was this book called Excuse Me, Your Life is Waiting by Lynn Grabhorn. And I, and it basically like my memory of it, which is a long time ago at this point, was, was that it was, you know, talking about law of attraction and basically like, you know, if you think more positively, then your life might shift in that direction. Like something like when around. you focus on, you yeah, find. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then from that point forward, I just felt like, all right, all this dark stuff that I was experiencing in college and beyond in those in between kind of, you know, five and a half years. Wow. Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's not who I am. And I had become really identified with it by that point. And so I was thrilled at the notion that, you know, maybe there's something beneath all of this. That's who I really am. And maybe I can like clean this up, you know? And at that point in time, I thought that therapy was like the only way to do that, Mm. like talk therapy. And, and there's, um, no, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Therapy is fantastic. I think everyone could benefit from therapy with a good therapist. Um, but in my experience, healing can happen in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. And dare I say, deeper, more profound ways than I experienced of that. And that journey started for me at that time. Mm-hmm. Something just big moved. And I was able to identify like, all right. I want to heal this stuff. I don't want to be this like dark person that wants to die anymore. I don't think that's who I really am. Mm. And so I kind of professed it to the universe. Like I, I I want to heal this. I don't know how, I don't know what that looks like, but I want it, Mm. you know? And that definitely set me off on a new trajectory, Mm. but it definitely all tied back to, you know, that experience of burnout in college. Yeah. Yeah. Did you work your way up to longer amounts of time of meditating? Oh, or absolutely. It? <laughs> oh, my God. And it, and it, and it's definitely not about time. I mean, it's about it's definitely about intention and sincerity. Hmm. Let me articulate that better. Intention and sincerity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um because a sincere well-intended three breaths can be, I think just as powerful (laughs) as, well, maybe, maybe, maybe all you need, depending on what, where you're, where you are. Um, but I think it can be just as powerful as, you know, a super distracted kind of insincere 10 minute sit, you know, or, I mean, I could go off on so many tangents, but like when I, I mean, at some point down the line, I started uh, practicing Sufism, which is the mystical branch of Islam. And uh, th- they, there are just these incredible tools uh, to bring healing in so many different ways. And for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go into any of that in this moment. But I used to use them like they were a hammer. And I, on myself, you know what I mean? Like I would take these gorgeous <laughs> tools rich with opportunity and I would yeah. like beat myself up with them because <sighs> that was just part of my path. That was part of my discovering. Oh my gosh. My, I mean this, I've had this uh, teacher and mentor that I've been working with for over a decade now. And the amount of times that <laughs> she would say to me, Bjorn, put down the hammer, <laughs> you know, I can't even count. Yeah. Um, but I really think that this sort of harshness towards oneself just happened to be in my lineage. And it's been uh, something that I've been healing these, over time. These three intentional breaths that you said can do so much in a minute, in a moment. What intentions do you set? Or what intentions would you recommend someone sets if they're having a moment of anxiety? Oh, Jesus, I got to get this done. We don't right. have time. That whole mind thing. Yeah, well, I guess it depends on where you're coming from, like situationally, of course. Um, but in general, I guess letting go. Letting go of whatever. I mean, you, if you're willing to pause, you can feel that there's like, a speeding train to our thoughts a lot of the time, I would say. Very much. Yeah. And so I think that the intention is simply to, I mean, maybe it's simply to notice it because you have to work with where you are. 
no matter what, you have to work with where you. So there's no, that's why there's no magic pill for all people mm. with this stuff. It's basically, well, where are you in this very moment and what would be best for you in this very moment? So the intention is like letting go of whatever is in the way right now in this moment, you know, and whether you believe in God or light or the universe or love or source or Allah or Yahweh, whatever your name is, or Buddha, uh, it, it doesn't matter. But for me, I would set the intention of like, addressing the divine or whatever speaks to you because you need to use something that feels right to you you know help me to let go of whatever i do not need in this moment yeah let go of whatever you do not need in this moment i can change so much well it also requires actually (laughs) prying the mind free again from like that door that you're trying so desperately to open you know because a lot of i think you know, we live in a world that values a lot of things that are not in alignment with, I think, what we're really here for. Yeah. And if you if you consume a lot of commercial television, if you are constantly scrolling on the apps, if you are yeah. if you are a, a regular consumer of all of the advertising that's out there, mm. you know, that's very much going to shape what you think you need to value, and. I would argue that probably if you didn't see any of that stuff, you probably wouldn't value that stuff. You probably wouldn't think you need it. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. It's it's so about like recognizing how I mean, I think step 1 is recognizing our attachment, you know? Cuz you can't let go of something unless you recognize it. Like I can't possibly say, "Okay, I'm I'm going to let go of this thing when the thing is a subconscious pattern. It's not possible because I'm not aware of it. It's not in my consciousness yet. So I can't let it go. You know, Mm. you, there needs to be light shed on it first to be able to be like, Oh my God, I'm doing that. Oh, okay. And sometimes that's really hard to look at. And we are clever. We humans are really skilled at keeping (laughs) ourselves. Yeah. In whatever bizarre ways, you know, we manage to. Yeah. And so a lot of that is like deceiving ourselves about what's really important and clinging and coming up with very crafty, intelligent reasons to make it completely logical. Yes. Why something is. Oh, (laughs) absolutely. Why something's important. Uh Why I need it this way. Why I think I need it today or, you know, Uh like all that stuff. Oof. You know, I, it's quick. Thank you to you before we continue on this, um, find you Zen December. Oh yeah. We have going on. I, while I have not meditated at all, in the last three days, <laughs> I had a massive discovery this morning. Of so, I've been working on a lot of projects, as you can see from like Facebook, whatever. Yeah, and I have been in on purpose not completing key parts of them because I'm afraid if I finish it, I won't have anything else to do with it, or it'll just be done, or it'll fall mm. off, or it won't complete, which could possibly not make sense to anyone listening. Makes all the sense in the world to, to me and the way I operate. But I didn't realize, I mean, that's been a pattern that I've had since last February, maybe. I've been getting stuff done, yeah, obviously, but the potential has been slightly locked up. You know, there could be more. And I realized that through the first few days that I did do meditation i will i will do it again i will well, whatever works but, for you but it's but <laughs> no it's a thank you thank you for that because yeah. that's something i realized that's really important that for me that's that really being a recognition of what we're doing yeah yeah well that oh, yeah. yeah and then like realizing oh i'm not completing things because i don't want to not have something to do with it but that's oh, one of yeah. those crafty crafty ways one of the of probably it logical. thousands maybe yeah. tens of thousands of things that we do that are like beneath the surface or behind the scenes. But I wouldn't have even gotten there if I hadn't sat down, you know, yeah, quietly for 30 minutes or whatever. Well, that's great. I'm so glad you discovered that for yourself. Yeah. Anyway, so that's a thank you. Yeah. You're, thank you for that. You're welcome. You might have already um, answered this question. When we lose focus, when you lose focus, how do you get back on track? Well, it depends on how off I am because there are times when like I'm clear that I'm off yeah. and I want to, st- and the part of me that's attached to like being in chaos wants to stay off and stay in chaos. Okay. So like there are, you know, there are varying degrees to which I'm like willing to refocus. Yeah. 
Um, and I think that kind of relates to maybe what you just said, just in terms of my, some of my own patterning. Sure. Um, cause sometimes I just want drama and chaos. Um, and yeah. so, okay. I mean, not consciously, but like, yeah, eh, let's, let's own it. Like, we're um, human. Right. I love that. You say that all the time. I love that. Anyway, go on. Sorry. <laughs> Continuing. No, it's cool. So I will, well, I know that if I sit and I mean, in meditation, mm-hmm intending to refocus to ground that that will work every time. Okay. Like it's, it will work every time. Yeah. Absolutely without fail. Uh, which is why, like I just said, there are times when I kind of don't, I kind of don't, I'm not ready. You know, like there's some part of me that's like, I'm like resisting. I'm like (laughs) enjoying the drama right now. (laughs) Yeah. I don't want to focus. Uh, but if I really want it, I can, notice like wow i feel really off okay i'm gonna choose to ground and so i'll just go inside and meditate for maybe 20 minutes or something like that and without fail it's moved yeah yeah how has how have you become less reactionary and more response (laughs) able (laughs) yeah well that's a great question and certainly through trial and error, certainly through almost what I was just saying about being able to recognize what you're doing in order to see the fruits of that Mm. sort of tumultuous, horrible labor. (laughs) Like I, I needed, I think I have needed, I'm not going to say that I've, I've got this conquered because I don't think we ever fully conquer anything. I think that healing happens, happens in layers Mm. and that, you know, you're able to work through something that maybe you're attached to that's not serving you Mm. and that cyclically you'll get back to that same thing, but maybe at a deeper level, Mm. you'd be like, Oh, this again, I remember this concept. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's work through that. But I'm digressing. Um, for me, bringing awareness to reaction has required me to react really badly. Like I've had to witness the, the, the effects of my flying off the handle, if that makes sense in order to see, it's almost sort of like in the same way that, uh, you know, in a cliche way you would see, someone who's an alcoholic, like really have to hit rock bottom in order to identify like I'm an alcoholic and then to move forward from there. For me, in terms of reactions, I've needed to be like reacting so badly that the effects of it are really not good so that I can notice how, whoa, look what I did there. Yeah, That's not how I want to live my life. So I've definitely had a (laughs) number, probably more than I could count. I mean, probably a lot that I'm not even aware of, you know, but having reaction, poor reaction. Oh yeah. Yeah. We all, yeah. 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 And, but also I think it's so important to recognize that kind of depending on what you're working on, if you are, especially if you are working towards cultivating, I don't know, uh, whatever you want to call it, more mindfulness or healing, being on a healing trajectory. Excuse me. Um, I just totally lost my train of thought. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it went. <laughs> and there it is. And there it's gone. But no, and yeah, talk but about letting less, go. Yeah, but being less re- less reactionary. My oh, response. Yeah. It's yeah. I under I understand what you're saying. I get it. I get that. And it. It's trial and error. It's like having doing something really badly, seeing the results of it, being able to identify like, wow, that was bad. That was not where I want to be. That's not how I want to be. Yeah. And then noticing it. Oh, I know what I was just saying. What I was just saying is depending on what you're working on, if there is something that you're working towards in terms of healing or something or just self-empowerment, self-embetterment, um, sometimes when you're working through your edges, stuff will bubble up that's really challenging for you. Actually, it always will, I think. Mm. Um, I think that if you're really doing the real work, you're going to bump up against your edges. And by edge, I mean like kind of that that zone where there's an opportunity to have a breakthrough. Like I don't think opportunity for breakthrough happens 
in a sort of safety net way over there. Comfort zone, yeah. Right. No, it happens when you're up against something that's challenging for you. It comes up like during a choice point. Like, do I behave the way I have traditionally or do I make the new choice? And there's a tension there because you have a habit built up of the way you've always done it. And maybe the way you've always done it is, I mean, I know people who grew up in households where there was a lot of anger and there was a lot of screaming. And as a result, you know, that's how they learn to communicate when they're frustrated. So they are very expressive vocally with when they get angry. Now, I grew mm-hmm. up in a house that was very traditionally sort of Scandinavian. And when we got mad, it got quiet. And it was like, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it's not. Neither, neither is ideal. You know, mm-hmm. the irrational screaming, not yeah. ideal. The quiet, silent, oh my gosh, I don't even know what to call it. Also not proactive. But yeah. when, you are, when you're working through something, say, I don't know, whatever it is, you're up against something that you're working on and there's a choice point here because like you can now decide to respond differently than you did before. It feels almost to me like this might sound weird, but like a birthing because you're having to give life to something you've never given life to in the past. You've only ever opted for the other option. And so it requires this like icky, uncomfortable experience of making a new choice. And that only can happen at an edge. And this is a long way of getting to a point of, and so sometimes you just react badly yeah. because you're maybe, I mean, I know for me with all that repressed anger, I mean, I, I grew up believing that anger was like just this destruct, like solely singularly destructive force, you know? Mm-hmm. So I could like feel the energy of anger without it being articulated in my household And then like at my dance studio, say, I would hear it and experience it being like unleashed constantly. And so there was this like, ah, it's a lot, you know? And so years ago when I was first being, uh, looking at being able to identify like for the first time in my life, just how many mountains of rage I had suppressed in me, some of the healing process required my reacting really badly because I had to honor it. I had to like let it out. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I could go back and let it out in ways that were less painful in some circumstances, I absolutely would. Yeah. But it was also part of the discovery process. Mm. In life, what's most important to you? Healing and growth. Grow. I mean, yeah, becoming, becoming aligned with what you're here, what your like soul is here for. And to me, that requires a tremendous amount of healing and growth. Yeah. Okay. Because I really want to live on purpose with what I'm really here for. Live on purpose. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Common piece of incorrect advice about meditating. Oh. (laughs) Which one? Yeah. (laughs) That your mind should be clear or empty when you're meditating. I mean, I don't know how many people out there who've never meditated will not even think about it because they believe that meditation is this thing where your mind is supposed to be clear. Mine's not. Yeah, (laughs) nor is mine. I'm ready to make lists. Oh my goodness, no, (laughs) mine's not either. I mean, years in, I can sit and experience gaps between the thoughts that are quite extensive um, now compared to years and years ago, which is beautiful, but also depending on what I'm going through that day, like maybe there's no gaps at all. Yeah. 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 Do you have a, a favorite failure or apparent failure that set you up for success? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Actually, it kind of speaks to what I was just talking about, about reacting. So a year ago in the spring, I was on a retreat in Sedona with my teacher and a, a group, it was a small group of us. And I was actually the teacher's assistant for that whole retreat. 
It was like a four day retreat. And I was, fa- I was failing on day two to support the group in the way that I was supposed to be supporting the group as the TA because I was caught in some of my old garbage that had bubbled up and gotten triggered while we were on this really long hike. And I just completely dropped the ball and I wasn't doing my job. I wasn't taking care of the group and I was mad. I was like (laughs) furious. I was so caught in my old, I mean, it's like this old illusion patterns, drama. It was stuff that was coming up to, to, for healing essentially. Um, but I super got caught in it and I, I basically let everyone down and I don't know that everyone that was there knew the extent to which I was, you know, failing as an assistant at that moment. Um, but that night, you know, before I went to sleep, uh, I was, I was staying with um, my mentor, the retreat leader, and she came to me, and I've been working with her for you know, a decade, and this was the first time in all of these years of working with her where I got like a hard dose of reality about how this was not acceptable at all. Mm-hmm. And it was so beautifully timed because it was exactly what I needed at that time in order to get the lesson. You know, I mean, the message that she had for me was about how, in essence, everything in our future is always being created here and now. So if you want your future to shift and you want these dreams that you have to come to fruition, if you keep engaging in these old destructive patterns, you're, those are the seeds you're planting every moment. So if you just hang on to these old spazzing out childhood reactions, mm. that's, you're just going to keep, keep getting more drama. You're not going to move through this. And the dreams that you have will not come to fruition because you're not feeding them you're feeding garbage and it, oh my goodness. I mean, like it came in a way that I just felt like I felt so humbled. I felt awful. I, (laughs) but not awful in a way that was like, Oh, poor me now care for me. I'm feeling so bad. But like, Mm. I felt the weight of that. Like I felt how much I was letting the group down and her down and God bless her. Kezibon, I'm going to drop her name because I haven't said it yet. Kezibon Azel is th- this tremendous, tremendous woman um, for supporting me through that. But I, I felt like, I felt just this really palpable, useful amount of bad about what I had done. You know, it was great because I was able to be with it and I was able to like kind of, well, not kind of be very humbled by it, be able to recognize it and look at it in a way that previously I was unwilling and unable because this pattern was something that I was really engaging in for basically my whole life, you know, creating drama that wasn't really real. And it was a tough pill to swallow and yet, Oh, what a gift. Like, I think the biggest gifts that come often come in packages that are are like very challenging, Mm -hmm. you know? So it was like a big, big failure and it, and it continues to teach me today. Mm. It was amazing. So well articulated too. Like it makes sense. Thanks. I I mean, that's so true though. Like your dreams won't come true if you keep feeding they can't. They can't. It's impossible. No. Like just impossible. I mean, and there's a degree to which I really believe. Okay. So on some level, I'm a fatalist. Like I believe in destiny in a lot of ways. I really do. I think that there's a trajectory of our lives that's being guided. I really do. Um, I would never force that belief on anyone else. Um, the reason I believe it is because I have enough experience of my own repetition of this sort of stuff that has has shown to me like 
There yeah. is an experience of that which feels true, like capital T true, not like debatable, but like because I viscerally know it, because I am experiencing something that is indisputably true right now. Um, I have so many experiences of that that are hard to talk about in words, but that absolutely support this idea. And I, so I think that there is an extent to which you know, something that is destined to happen is going to happen. Um, maybe it's about a career path, a career success. Maybe it's about relationship, people you meet, people you work with. Mm. Um, maybe you're meant to be parents. Maybe you're not meant to be parents. Um, you know, any of these big things that affect the course of your whole life. Um, and I firmly believe that a lot of it is, is supported by something much bigger than us. Mm. That being said, we can get in the way tremendously. Yeah. 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 Do you have, um, do you have most gifted books or books that you recommend? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> on this topic, other topics, sure. Just general. I mean, there are so, there are so many great books I've read over the years. Like, of course, and I'm, I'll, I'll rattle off a little list of stuff that I've just found influential. Like if you haven't read the power of now Eckhart Tolle, mm -hmm. and I'm, I never know if it's Eckhart Tolle or Tolle. Um, that's just great. The Four Agreements, Don Miguel Ruiz. That I mean, these are books that I read a long time ago, but they're the types of books that you could revisit and read again year after year, and they're going to speak to you in a new way every single year that you read them, provided you're growing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> provided you're growing. Yeah. You know, because you revisit yeah. something. I mean, it's this, this might seem off track, but like I can look back at a TV series that I was obsessed with, you know, 10 years ago and feel like, oh, I, like I liked that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but there was something going on in my life at the time that it, it resonated with me yeah. and it no longer does. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so those are a couple. I absolutely adore books by this um, Zen teacher. Her name is, again, I don't know if it's Cherry or Sherry because the name is spelled C-H-E-R-I. And her last name is Huber, H-U-B-E-R. And she has all of these wonderful books. She has, she's written, I don't know, more than 10. And they're very, uh, one of them is called uh, something like, there's nothing wrong with you. That's not it. I'm sl but if you look up Sherry Huber, you're going to find it. Okay. There's another book called The Depression Book that she writes about. She takes a very Zen teacher approach to concepts that we grapple with all of the time. And she writes about them in a way that is so digestible and so easily understandable. And the books are actually handwritten. Like the type is, it's like someone's handwriting. And then there are pictures that accompany. And they're oh. very s simplified. Yeah. And I love them. And I've gifted those a number of times. The Depression Book. It sounds awful. Like, I don't want to read something called The Depression Book. Uh. Check it out. It's fantastic. Uh. It talks about depression in a way that just makes it feel so like, oh, yes. Oh, my God. I never saw it that way. Thank you. You know, like all of her books that I've checked, I haven't read them all. But yeah. anything by her that I've read, I've, I've just felt like so rewarded by. Yeah. So there would be another one. If you could put a word or a phrase, metaphorically speaking, on a billboard for millions of people to see, does anything come to mind? You're, well, is it a billboard that's new and fancy and electronic that can change? Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> what are the things that come to mind? <laughs> um, so if it was an electronic billboard that could shift, it would say trust really big. And then it would shift to let go. And then it would shift to thank you. Maybe not in that order. Maybe it would say let go first. Let go, trust, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been wonderful. This has been such a wonderful conversation. For me too, and thank you so much. I mean, I'm, we know each other, but we've yeah. never talked about some of the topics we've talked about. So this is fun to learn more you know, about your path. And most definitely, a lot of it applies to me, and I'm sure it'll apply to the people listening. So, thank you. I appreciate that. I hope so. I hope it's helpful. Where can we find you? Uh, <laughs> Is that a loaded question? <laughs> Do you want to answer that? Well, well put it in I'm the show sitting notes in your apartment well. right now. Yeah. Um, I'm on Facebook, of course. I don't. I shouldn't say, of course. A lot of people aren't, and I have a lot to. I have a lot of respect for people who somehow manage to live life without 
being on Facebook. Right. <laughs> Digression. Um, I'm on Instagram uh, on my personal page. Free to be you and me is my personal Instagram, mm-hmm. which is the title of a TV show that I loved as a child. And then uh, my photography Instagram is find the light photography. And then, of course, I have a photography website. Same title? Yeah, findthelightphotography.com. This is wonderful. Is there anything you want to add before we finish up here? Anything that... No, I'm just I'm just grateful that you invited me here today to do this. And I love that... I love that our initial, our like initial responses to things can just be super wrong. Because when you asked me, my, there was some part of me that was afraid or reluctant, you know, that was like, I don't know if I want, (laughs) I don't know if I want to be interviewed. Um, I'm so glad that that's uh, just kind of. In, invalid a lot of the time it's good to recognize that our it's funny there's a dichotomy here between there's a gut reaction we have to things maybe it's a heart reaction or a gut reaction that is really important to practice paying attention to to learn mm. you know and this is all through trial and error yeah. but then sometimes there's an initial reaction that's just a mind reaction that is just there to sabotage you you know and so just to notice throughout your day how you react to ideas that are posed to you or questions that are asked for you and just notice like what is the where's the reaction like is this just a fear that's reacting or is this like clear guidance is this a yes or a no and why you know and be willing to be curious about where the reaction's coming from and is this good is this good advice coming from my interior or is this bad old patterning (laughs) that's just trying that's wanting to keep me stuck you know yeah that wants to keep banging on that door i want this door to open (laughs) you know i do yeah i do thank you for saying that thank you this has been fun yeah thank you it's been great ladies and gentlemen boys and girls bjorn belinder You've been listening to Entertainment X, the podcast. You can follow Entertainment X on Instagram at underscore Entertainment X underscore. If you haven't yet, go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Join Clay next week for another curiosity conversation on Entertainment X. Thank you for listening. <laughs>